Okay, so we are very excited and honored to have with us uh, on the line Stephen Kinzer. Um, he is he, he's an author of a lot of great books. I'll get to those in a second. But um, he is also a senior fellow at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. He's the author of uh, several books, uh, for, I think pretty popular books. And, and I had read a few of these before I came across the subject of today, uh, uh, books like All the Shah's Men about the uh, the CIA coup in Iran, which we're still dealing with, Overthrow, which is a great sort of overview of, of America's history of imperial regime changes and coups, uh, Bitter Fruit about the CIA coup in, um, in Guatemala, um, The Brothers about the Dulles Brothers, uh, Pretty scary, horrible people there, um, and and then a, a, another book too. That one of these days, I think we might want to get around to this. I, I I didn't know you wrote this book, Crescent and Star: Turkey Between uh, Between Two Worlds. But it's also Turkey. It's about the rise of Turkey out of the Ottoman Empire's ashes, and we keep coming across this story in so many wars that we talk about. That one of these days, I think we should come. We should talk specifically about this book in this period. However, the subject of today's show is Stephen Kinzer's last book, uh, The True Flag, Theodore Roosevelt, Mark Twain, and the Birth of American Empire. And just by way of a brief introduction, uh, John and I, going back to earlier episodes of of Radio Warner, we wanted to do an episode on the Spanish-American War. And frankly, it's such a rotten war, and the books were pretty rotten too because they didn't they couldn't kind of fight their way out of that bag and so I was really excited to come across this book you found a way to present a very rotten war in a very readable interesting way that has a lot of resonance with what's going on uh still today in American discourse and politics so anyway thanks for joining us Stephen well thank you it's good to be with you uh, as you say I'm I'm always looking for ways to uh, tell historical stories uh, in uh, a form that's interesting and exciting, but also illustrates uh, the relevance of uh, the past to the present. I'm always looking for some story that was hugely important and that greatly influenced the course of history, but that for whatever reason, we don't know about. It's kind of fallen out of history. When I wrote that book about the uh, overthrow of Mossadegh in Iran in 1953, there had never been a book written about that. That's incredible. Um, so, <laughs> Isn't it? Really, it's it's yeah. remarkable. And yeah. I, I think it, it speaks to something that's uh, not just typically of, uh, typical of the United States, but probably uh, accentuated here. And that is that uh, we're not reflective about the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't feel that we have lessons to learn from the past. Uh, we feel that we're we're so different from any other country that ever existed, and our position in the ro- in the world is so different from that that any country has ever occupied that there really isn't any reason for us to go back and look at what went wrong in the past. Um, and this leads us to great shock when uh, people in the world don't seem to love us and appreciate us uh, <laughs> and see us as having the great goodwill and the innocence that we think of ourselves as having. So I'm trying to tell stories to see the world a little bit from the perspective beyond Washington. Yeah. Well, I think what what struck me about your book is that uh, having grown up as an American kid long ago, I have a series of quick uh, images from the Spanish-American War, most of them drawn or painted by really good artists like Frederick Remington, I think, and all those great Western artists, Teddy Roosevelt charging up San Juan Hill, even though it was actually Kettle Hill, as you explained. And what I don't have is any sense at all of the Philippine-American War. And the the Spanish-American War was almost like a pantomime prelude to the terribly grim and much bigger story you described with the Philippine War. You're absolutely right. So uh, like most Americans, you and I grew up with a false impression of uh, what had happened in Cuba in 1898, if we had any impression at all. But when it comes to the Philippines, we, we had nothing. We yes. knew nothing. I think uh, this is a war that almost no Americans know ever happened. Yet it was devastating. We, we, tr- we left hundreds of thousands of 
Filipinos dead. Um, it was our first guerrilla war. It was our first counterinsurgency. We had our first torture scandals in the Philippines. Um, it was the beginning of a process that set off Asian nationalism and definitely helped to lead to the Chinese Revolution, the Korean War, uh, Vietnam War. This was our first uh, plunge into uh, mass warfare against largely civilian populations in Asia. And uh, the fact that we were able to forget it so soon mm -hmm. uh, is a reflection of uh, our emergence as what uh, Gore Vidal used to call the United States of Amnesia. <laughs> um, I was, however, interested to notice something about a year ago that didn't seem to get much coverage in the U.S. press. Uh, at a certain moment, the uh, authoritarian leader of the Philippines, Duterte, made a uh, statement at a press conference about wanting to break off relations with the United States. He went into a rant about how the U.S. had never really been a friend of the Philippines and we didn't want all those bases. In the United States... This was taken as an evidence of uh, Duterte's mental instability mm -hmm. uh, and not having any rational basis, in fact. But when I looked a little further at the photos, so I saw a picture of uh, Duterte making this statement in the American newspaper. But if you went to other newspapers outside the United States, you could see that instead of just waving his arms, he actually was waving a large photograph. And he was pointing to this photograph uh, as he was talking about the United States role in the Philippines over history. Sure enough, it's a photo of a platoon of United States Marines standing over a pit of dead bodies of women and children they've just massacred in, in uh, some village, in a particular episode very well known in the Philippines. Uh, and uh, it showed me again how that was a, more than a 100 years after... That massacre happened. We forget these things so quickly, but uh, they do fester and burn in the hearts and souls and minds of people in other countries. My work is a little bit of an effort to try to make Americans understand how uh, these episodes make us look to them. Well, one thing that, that struck me about this, uh, this whole strange three-year period in, in America is that we might have trouble introducing it because it's not only virtually unknown in the U.S. I suspect it's little known at all outside the U.S. Do you, do you think it would be possible to summarize the major events uh, of this three-year period we'll be discussing? Because a lot of our audience is not American, and then the rest of it is American, <laughs> which means, as you say, they don't know either. <laughs> uh, that's actually a really good place to start. So let me try to give a brief summary of what happened during this period. Uh, 1898 was the year when the United States changed more dramatically than in any year in our history. So at the beginning of that year, uh, we were still in what was called the gay 90s or the Victorian age or the Gilded Age. Um, America didn't seem to have any inclination towards overseas conquest. Uh, we had finished our imperial takeover of North America by subduing the native peoples and uh, expelling uh, most of uh, the population from what we took from Mexico. Uh, and we seem to be pretty much uh, happy with what we had. By the end of that year, 1898, we were in a frenzy of conquest and we had conquered nations with millions of people all over the world. So how did that happen? Well, several incidents uh, and forces coincided at the same time. There was a group of people in the United States led by Senator Henry Cabot Lodge in Massachusetts and uh, later by Theodore Roosevelt, who went on to become president after the assassination of President McKinley, uh, that the U.S. should not be satisfied within the borders of North America, that we should join the colonial race with all the European countries and go out and seek our fortune in the world, try to take over other territories. Um, but the American people weren't really interested in that. Meanwhile, uh, there was an ambitious newspaper publisher, originally from San Francisco, he landed in New York, uh, who was looking for a way to make a lot of money and build up the circulation of his newspaper. That was William Randolph Hearst, the uh, founder of what we call yellow journalism. Hearst understood something that uh, journalistic entrepreneurs understand even today, and that is, if you want to get people to 
pay attention to the news every day, buy a newspaper or tune in. You need what we call a running story, a story that goes every day, not just something that happens one day and then it's over. And the best running story of all is war. So Hearst realized that if he could get uh, the United States into any war anywhere, uh, he could then uh, build up stories about heroes and traitors and battles, and that would sell lots of newspapers. He looked around and found out that uh, there was indeed a civil conflict going on in Cuba, and he set out to rouse the American people into outrage at the evils uh, that were being uh, committed by Spanish occupiers in Cuba, he succeeded in doing this. That coincided with Lodge's view and Roosevelt's view that the U.S. should be intervening in other places. Uh, the president of the U.S. sent a uh, ship, a warship, to Havana Harbor. It exploded. We now know that was an accident, but at the time it was portrayed as an attack by Spain against the United States. Uh, with that war fervor, the U.S. then declared war on Spain. And here's where the story gets interesting. Because the whole idea of the Spanish-American War was Cuba. People had been following Cuba. We'd read stories about all the horrors in Cuba, just like what we read today, how evil it is in Iran, how brutal it is in Syria. It's the exact same template. Uh, Hearst really started that in this period. Uh, but we're, so the U.S. Army decided in order to prevent the Spanish fleet from attacking us in retaliation for going to war with them, we need to find the Spanish fleet and sink it. So we had to look around the world and find that fleet. <laughs> we finally found it in a place that no American had ever heard of, and that was the Philippine Islands. So sure enough, Teddy Roosevelt, then at the Navy Department, sent a uh, squadron to blow up the Spanish fleet in the harbor at Manila in the Philippines. And that's when we realized, what do we do now with the Philippines? So it's been a Spanish colony for centuries. We just sunk the Spanish fleet. They're gone. So what do we do now? Well, some people said, great, there's been a Filipino independence movement. Let's give the Filipinos what we won in our revolution. Give them their freedom. Give them their independence. But then people like Roosevelt and Lodge were saying, now, wait a minute. That's going too far. Why don't we take them? And this question, should the United States a former colony itself, start going out into the world and taking colonies and subjecting other countries, seized public attention in the United States. And that's the central story of my book, The True Flag. I said earlier that all of my books are efforts to find unknown stories. So this is a debate that seized the United States in 1898, 1899, Every major political and intellectual figure took part in it. It was on the newspaper front pages day after day. The United States Senate debated it for 32 days in a row. And it was a question that everyone at that time realized was going to set the whole future course of the United States. Because they all recognized, and you can see this from the speeches that I quote in my book during the Senate debate and in the press, they all understood that this is not just a debate about the Philippines. It's not just the debate about whether we should take over one country or not. This is a debate on whether the United States is going to set off on the course of overseas empire. And now we've forgotten that debate. But to me, it's the debate I wish we were having in America now. So one of the emotions that I had while uncovering this debate, which has largely been lost to history, was envy. I, I hmm. wish we could have the debate now with the vibrancy and the intensity uh, that they had then over the question of what one senator said was the greatest question that has ever been presented in the history of our republic. Should we become a colonizing country, or should we concentrate on developing our own nation as an example to the world? And that's why the story of this book, The True Flag, really has a resonance today. I mean, it was quite close, too, as you pointed out every time, although it feels in hindsight like it was fated to turn imperialist no matter what. But at the time, it surely certainly didn't seem that way. And, you know, the vote on this uh, treaty uh, that you write about, I mean, it was decided by one vote. The Supreme Court ruled the constitutionality of of, uh, of, of ruling over the Philippines by by one judge. Um, so everything everything was 
decided quite closely, right? Um, I didn't realize this either. And yeah. as I said, the whole story of this debate was unknown to me like it is to most Americans. Yeah, it, it's amazing to reflect on that point you just uh, you just mentioned. Uh, had it been for a couple of different votes in the Senate or in the Supreme Court, uh, we might have decided uh, either that it was bad politics or unconstitutional for the United States to go off on uh, these kinds of foreign adventures. And uh, we're we're still debating that now. Yeah. One of the one of the strangest parallels, and there are a lot of weird echoes of yes. our era in this book, is the importance of a few very rich people, not all of them entrepreneurs, but some of them, like Andrew Carnegie, definitely self-made entrepreneurs who were worshipped then as as we rep- worship a, a new generation of entrepreneurs. And one of the most astonishing things I found in the book is that Carnegie, who was strongly anti-imperialist, offered to buy the Philippines <laughs> from the, the U.S. government for $20 million because he knew, I, and as far as I know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, he wasn't trying to make a profit off the Philippines. He just had a sense of how disastrous it would be to become the imperial owner of a foreign territory. You're absolutely right. Uh, So one of the stories that I tell in my book is the emergence of the Anti-Imperialist League. Uh, This was an organization which for several years around the turn of that century had huge influence in the United States. it had all kinds of supporters from people like uh, Booker T. Washington, the African-American crusader, to Jane Addams, the social worker in New York, and then uh, a couple of former presidents, uh, and uh, Mark Twain, other great intellectual figures. Uh, and uh, this organization mobilized public opinion in the United States in a way that hasn't been done ever since. So... Uh, the focus of the uh, of their activism was this treaty by which the United States uh, was going to take over the Philippines. And uh, as part of that campaign, the Anti-Imperialist League published, sent out millions of broadsides, had hundreds of meetings all over the United States, and really engaged the entire American people in this very profound debate. Uh, so what I take away from the story of the Anti-Imperialist League uh, is that uh, individuals can seize on to this issue. Now, in those days, the Anti-Imperialists saw themselves as very much the heirs of the abolitionist movement mm-hmm. and also women's suffrage. For them, there were these three causes. Uh, no slavery, women should vote, and we shouldn't be imperialist. Uh, so what I'm seeing now in American politics is that a number of people who are actually quite progressive on domestic issues and would favor things like national health insurance and for funding for public schools and so forth um, are reluctant to challenge the tropes of American dominance in foreign policy. Actually, uh, as some of the people in 1898 pointed out, as soon as you set out on the course of empire, um, you are accepting the idea that some people are born to rule and some nations are born to rule and others are born to obey. Once you accept that policy in world affairs, you're more or less accepting it also in the uh, running of your own country. So... uh, the idea that we could brutalize people far away in, term, uh, in, in service of what we consider to be our national interest softened us to the idea that we could then brutalize people here at home for the same reasons. And uh, many of the uh, warnings that I see from the speeches of the anti-imperialists that are in my book actually did come to pass. They, they warned exactly that plutocracy is the inevitable result of imperialism because it requires centralized government, big tax raises, support for arms industries, and that creates a constituency for more and more war and conquest. So yes, you, uh, you have a you have a speech or an excerpt from a speech by a Harvard professor. I forget his name, something like Sumner, who said. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
plutocracy is going to be the problem and imperialism will create plutocracy. It was an amazing speech. And as Mark was saying, the, the foresightedness, the prescience of a lot of the rhetoric in these speeches is remarkable. Well, actually, one of the things that uh, grabbed me while I was doing this research uh, was how sophisticated the debate was. Yeah. And even the bad guys yes. were brilliant. Yes. Uh, yes. The speeches are filled with references to Pliny the Elder <laughs> and the Catalan conspiracy, you know, things that you'd never dare to discuss with a U.S. senator today. But uh, these people, uh, senators in those days and intellectual figures were so steeped in, uh, in history and uh, world politics that they were able to conduct a debate uh, on a level that almost makes you want to weep when you read it today. Well, one of the uh, things that also surprised me is um, uh, at, at some point, the pro-imperialist um, orators uh, and advocates like Beveridge and Lodge started to to make, I guess, what you would call a, a sort of a realist argument um, against the anti-imperialists by saying, what what fantasy world are you anti-imperialists living in? How do you think America was born? What, you know, in a cookie bake-off? I mean, it was born through imperialism. The land you, you were living on was also taken from uh, people who lived here and moved west. And so, so well, they, were, they were basically... At using what it, what would today be an anti-imperialist argument against them, or basically the rhetoric that today is pretty common among like even undergrad anti-imperialists about how America is basically kind of born in sin um, and imperialism, but using that to argue against the anti-imperialists to show up their hypocrisy. You know, it was just surprising to read it so eloquently presented by right-wing imperialists. You know. Well, they were a little bit more forthright and honest. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. They, they quote this speech where one of the senators says, we do not have one foot of territory that we didn't take from somebody else. <laughs> right. So get over it. Yeah. Now, uh, I think the answer that many of the anti-imperialists would make, based on the ethos of that age, was, yes, we accept the idea of manifest destiny. But manifest destiny meant that we were supposed to take over North America. It meant that we were supposed to seize Mexico and take over a lot of its land. It meant that we were supposed to kill all the Indians. It meant that we were supposed to establish the rule of the white race in North America. Now we have done that. That is our manifest destiny. It does not extend beyond North America. Uh, but the imperialists are saying, why stop at California? Just because we got to the end of North America, yeah. right. we shouldn't stop the impulse that has created America in the first place. Mm. So that was the essence of yeah. that great debate. That's where there's a strange intermittent parallel, if you could call it that, to Britain that keeps coming up. And it comes up in some really shocking ways. For example, I didn't know that Kipling's poem, Take Up the White Man's Burden, was addressed to America on the mm -hmm. eve of the Philippine War, but that's something you point out, and it's really yeah, amazing. I that but beyond that, a, a similar argument by one of the imperialist senators was, look at England. What, I'm quoting from your book. Look at England. What would she be today if confined to her insular domain? So there, there's always the shadow of the most successful empire in the world at the time, which was England, and, and the urge to follow her pattern. But at the same time, among the anti-imperialists, who are, are real Anglophiles and consider themselves Anglos, there's at the same time this wariness, like, no, we don't want to do that. Well, the whole idea of the American experiment was to create something different from and apart from the European experience. And I think um, we've never really resolved uh, a dichotomy or a debate that uh, has been with us ever since the time of the pilgrims. You'll remember that John Winthrop uh, made that famous speech in 1630 saying, uh, we shall be as a city upon a hill and the eyes of all people are upon us. So what did he mean? Did he mean uh, the world is an unclean place and we are going to go out and cleanse it and redeem it? Or did he mean we're going to create a virtuous society here in North America and then maybe other good people will want to copy us. Mm -hmm. Is it supposed to be an aggressive uh, approach to changing the world, or is it one that's supposed to be an exemplary 
uh, approach, like we're going to set a good example. We were arguing about that ever since Winthrop made that speech, and we still haven't decided what's the best role for the United States in the world. Is it to set an example of virtue and democracy at home and hope that other countries which have their own backgrounds and their own histories and their own needs and their own cultures will follow some aspects of what we do if they admire it? Or is it our role to go out into the world and to transform it into what we think it should be? I, 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 one of the things you point out a lot, which I really like, is, is are these... I mean, if, let's let's we're all three Americans, uh, born in America at least. So, um, but what if we look at America a bit as as if we're foreigners? And and you point out the kind of the the paradox, some of the paradoxes in the American character that we probably take for granted and don't really see as paradoxes. I mean, particularly sort of imper- an imperialist tendency and an anti-imperialist sentiment coexisting side by side without any sense that there's anything weird about it. Um, and that that was going on then and, and that goes on today. And and, and also that, that sort of that, um, uh, I don't know if it's even sentimental, but this, this humanitarian urge to, um, to save the world and to do good and to spread good around the world can exist very easily side by side with this, with this utter ruthlessness when things don't quite go our way and a willingness to exterminate. 